Class, good morning. It's good to be with you again as we are continuing our Bible study series based on the book written by Ray Comfort entitled Faith is for Weak People. I have intentionally kept today's Bible study lesson uh, a little longer and a little closer to my heart just because of the title of the book and the nature of our question today. And uh, just kind of going over some things in preparation, and I kind of feel led to maybe take this particular uh, series lesson and, and divide it up into a couple of parts. And uh, of course, I'll get to that at the very end today. But uh, anyway, here, here's our question. And uh, again, uh, a statement, uh, a question, and then a good statement. Uh, kind of put it in red today just to kind of make it a little easier to see. But here it is. Seeing is believing, okay? In a world in which we live that is so existential, uh, that, that's the statement uh, of belief of, of a lot of people, okay? I've got to see it to believe it. But seeing is believing. Why do I need faith? Faith is for weak people. And um, so uh, there, when you receive this question, uh, as the Christian in conversation with someone who, again, is uh, appearing to be uh, cynical, uh, skeptical, or, once again, a, a genuine truth seeker. When you hear this question offered to you, uh, there is an air of condescension about it uh, that might make you feel as if you're being uh, belittled, maybe. But uh, before we get into this particular question, and again, we're going to do some backfill maybe the next time that we're able to get together. Uh, let's go to the scriptures. Uh, if this verse and the ones that will follow seem a bit familiar to you, uh, they should. In fact, I think, uh, well, they are, and, and I hope they do. Uh, we actually used these verses uh, back a few weeks ago when we were talking about the question or answers to the question about being good enough to go to heaven. But we're going to get to look at it today from a little bit of a different angle. It's one of the beauties of the Word to me is that uh, you can take the same verse uh, at different times, different days, different weeks, and you can read them and you can come up with something under the leadership and guidance of Holy Spirit that might mean something different to you from one time to the next. I think it just testifies to just how deep a store well and a reservoir of knowledge and wisdom and beauty that the Word of God holds. But Paul, writing this to the church in Corinth, chapter 1, verse 27 of 1 Corinthians, says this, But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things that are strong. Again, the, the, the gospel message, uh, the good news as we refer to it as, uh, God's love for us, providing Jesus, Jesus' willingness to lay down his life, to go to a cross, to, to pay the ultimate price through sacrifice for us in order that our sin debt could be paid for. Uh, and that by exercising saving faith and turning our life completely over to him, trusting him, uh, becoming a Christian, him saving us, God imparting and imputing into us the righteousness of Christ in order that we from that point forward can live and walk in a newness of life. The world apart from Christ can see that and hear that and try to process that uh, from a worldly standpoint. And they can view that as being uh, quite foolish. Uh, well, who would believe such nonsense? You, you know, you can't go as far as to say that uh, you don't believe in Jesus uh, to the point that you don't believe he existed because we know that he's, he was a historical figure. Some people would almost be willing to to tempt you into thinking that they have gone that far. But uh, to a lost world, uh, to a fallen world, to people who don't know Christ, who are trying to work through and navigate through the complications of life on their own, essentially, as slaves to sin, whether they would want to admit it or not, the good news of the gospel uh, seems like foolishness to them. And we appear to be foolish those who profess and possess Christ as Christians uh, to go out purporting such a good news message. Uh, only foolish people, foolish things, 
would choose to go out and to make it seem to a lost and dying world that we believe in such a foolish message. So, uh, and it's getting more challenging and more difficult, I feel, as we continue to go forward um, to try to convince a lost and dying world of their need for Jesus. Fact is, we're, we're not doing it on our own anyway, and that's wonderful news of hope for us all. So, uh, that being said, uh, and again, just kind of reiterating, what we have just said, uh, a foolish message, uh, that God would choose to use weak vessels, uh, those who are prone to kind of wander like us, human beings. But we've been uh, extended the highest honor and privilege uh, of, of being uh, on mission with God to be able to share this good news and that Holy Spirit could use us in some way, shape, or form to lead others toward or to Christ. God does the saving. But my goodness, he has extended to us a part in a marvelous, marvelous process. And, and when, if folks want to come up with, with a why, to, to why is this, or why choose you, or you know why this message, listen, because it goes beyond human reason. What God is trying to do for us is eliminate anything that we might have in and of ourselves anything that we would have in and of ourselves to boast about, okay? Remember, it's not of works. If salvation was of things that we could do, we would only boast and brag about that. Again, Paul's writing to the church in Ephesus. So, you know, we can see the reason why these things are. And, and, and here again, a couple of verses. I'll just kind of a, allude to them here out of Acts 13. We talked about, you know, the word of the prophets, you know, that there would be scoffers, that, uh, you know, a, a work that would be done, a word that would be shared in which, you know, folks would never believe. We find ourselves living in much the same time today, uh, the, the beauty of prophetic fulfillment. So, you know, when we receive a, a question or hear a question coming at us like this, where we might want to take this a bit personally, as if they're looking at us and they're thinking, okay, are they looking at me and calling me weak? Uh, does that sound uh, belittling uh, in a way? Uh, you got to be very, very careful. Uh, understand just how easily that our emotions can kind of get involved. We can appear and sound and uh, come across as being a bit defensive. We do not want to allow that happen. I have been guilty of that have been called out uh, as a result of that, and, and deservedly so. But we need to be very careful. Allow the Holy Spirit to stay in front of us here to guard anything that might take place where something might well up inside of us that could cloud our ability to process clearly and allow the Holy Spirit to do the work that He desires to do. So as we're moving forward here, some things to consider, okay? A truth that we need to understand. A person who doesn't know Christ may not get this, may take this the wrong way, but nevertheless it is true that God has deliberately added incidents within his word that would confound worldly wisdom. Listen, there are things in the word of God, many, many things, that go beyond uh, man's ability to reason them through, as if they can put natural law together, the natural occurrence of things, and, and, and explain how that took place or why it took place. I mean, my goodness gracious, let's just go right to the heart of the gospel good news, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have enough evidence, a wealth of evidence, to stand behind that as being true. Uh, certainly, raising someone from the dead who had been dead uh, uh, up until that third appointed day when he rose from the dead, uh, you know, for that to take place, uh, people saw that, attested to that, many, many people. Uh, that goes beyond natural law. And there are many other things. It, it, listen, if it could happen one time, and we know that it did through the life of Jesus Christ, and we know through the Bible it happened many times, but if it can happen once, it can happen any time. So, you know, there are things dotted throughout the Bible that would confound worldly wisdom and worldly reason. A lot of folks who are skeptics, who are cynics, they like to go to the story of Noah, and uh, they really like to pick that apart. And 
might even go as far as to come toward us with some sort of a question as if to say, do you believe that kind of nonsense? Well, <laughs> matter of fact, yes, we do. And because we can believe that story and because we can believe every story within the Bible because of its divine inspiration and all the things that lend to its credibility and authenticity, and we could just go on and on about science and archaeology and history and literary credibility and all those things, uh, you know, we can stand not only in the story of Noah, but every story in the Bible where, you know, it just makes you take back as to what God can do because of who God is. Remember, all-powerful, all-knowing, but again, unimaginably loving, and we never want to lose sight of that. But again, coming back to this word faith, we, we've got to be aware that in the day and age in which we're living, uh, you know, things that we accept by faith in the Bible, things that we just can't figure out with our own method of reasoning. Listen, to a proud mind, those things can be quite offensive. I mean, not just something that stirs a curiosity, not just something that might, within a conversation, uh, tend to be a bit controversial. Uh, I, I would say almost to the point of being combative. Th this can offend people. So just be aware of that as we're working through uh, questions that begin to uh, steer toward or involve the topic of faith, faith in God, faith in Jesus Christ. But God did that within his word <laughs> so that those who think that they know it all would be confounded by it uh, to the point of becoming argumentative over it. So uh, just keep those in mind. But... Uh, and this is where we'll end today. We're not going to do it right now, but we'll come to this. You know, Jesus offered a word. Uh, he offered a challenge. You could almost look at this almost as, as a warning of sorts. And I'll come to the scripture here in just a little bit. But listen, there, there was not a demographic, not a group of people in the word that I see, that I read about, that you might read about, that Jesus seemed to love and adore more than children. And he used them to teach as he was blessed by them being around him. And listen, I'm sure that they, listen, uh, he was blessed to have them near as they, I think, were just adoring of him. Uh, I just feel like anywhere that Jesus was, the children just weren't far away from him. And he used that as an object lesson as to how we as human beings would enter the kingdom. He said we would do so like children. That's actually going to come out of Mark. We'll read that just a little bit later on. But, uh, you know, he, he warned, listen, to enter the kingdom, you must be willing to stoop down in order to enter there. We'll, we'll come back to that. And, and next time we meet, we'll, we'll actually talk a little bit more about that. But uh, again, just be aware that the words faith and believe as it applies to Christianity, faith-based conversations, uh, that can make people feel a bit uneasy to the point of uh, making them feel uh, a little overly sensitive. We just need to be considerate of that. Give people plenty of room uh, to say what's on their heart and mind, how the Holy Spirit can take those moments and open up some things that we can go with just a little bit further. But uh, you know, in conversation with someone, if things are starting to feel a bit tense, uh, a, a little um, uneasy, uh, maybe a little unpredictable, um, one way that you can kind of step back into the conversation as the Holy Spirit is leading you to lead them uh, is maybe just offer a question. You know, answering questions with questions. We've referred to that a number of times. This might be something... Uh, that you might want to consider. Uh, again, be, be careful. Be careful. But, you know, if, if it appears that the word faith is troubling to them, okay, that, that certainly could very well speak to the heart of, of where they are or where they are not with the person of Jesus Christ. But just ask them. So, you know, tell me here, what, what problem might you have, you know, with, with faith? You know, tell me what bothers you or seems to really irritate you about that. See what the Holy Spirit might unearth there along the way. And, and listen, here's a question that kind of steps out of the faith conversation, but it certainly keeps you very close 
that you could walk along with it. Uh, and I like this question because it makes great logic and sense. Aren't all relationships, partnerships, contracts, treaties, aren't they all founded on the principle of faith? I mean, you, you, you make an agreement with someone. You make a promise or a commitment. I mean, my goodness, it could be just as trivial as shaking a hand. Uh, you know, uh, it, it could be the spoken word. Hey, do I have your word on that? It, it could be requiring pen on paper to sign a name, date it, notarize it, whatever the case may be. But, you know, aren't all of those, however you want to define it in whatever arena, aren't all those based on a faith principle that you're believing that whoever or whatever group, they're going to keep their word, they're going to keep it, uh, you know, uh, they're going to keep it intact, what you agree to uh, in principle, in word, however you put it, however it's stated, uh, you know, aren't we exercising, you know, faith that uh, it will continue to stay as we agreed that it would? That's faith principle. Aren't we all operating on faith uh, in many, many circumstances of life? And, 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 and if that seems to kind of get the wheels turning just a little bit, understand that your humility, uh, your mild and gentle spirit in conversation, the Holy Spirit can do so much there to divide a spirit of cynicism regarding this matter of faith. Maybe you could take that question that we just talked about and Maybe you could ask maybe a couple more. If you get the opportunity to do that, I think that's progress. But you could say, listen, is there, is there any type of relationship without faith? Any relationship at all? Uh, and this is where it gets, you know, kind of serious. It's a pointed question, but, you know, listen, it, it begs for an answer. Uh, if you're basically saying that you don't have faith in another, are, are you, in essence, calling them out as a liar? Now, all of these things can circle back around if they're offered in the right spirit to this place of where maybe faith is no longer considered a threat. And if the Holy Spirit is able to use us, and He can, to bring someone around to that summary conclusion, I think even in the midst of that conversation, if it doesn't all summarize and conclude in, in one sitting, I think that's a great work and great progress has been made. So listen, just, just remember, and I've got this little header at the top, re remain poised. Don't allow the situation or the conversation to get bigger than you. Poised is kind of a sports term there. Uh, and, and here's something, and, and again, tread carefully here. You, you, you might even interject kind of a, a statement here, a rhetorical type statement. You know, you could look at a person if they're processing this. Listen, you'll get the sense of the climate and the tone of the conversation. You'll know in your spirit, Holy Spirit will confirm to you, hey, there's progress being made here. Be careful, be careful. You might even go as far as to say, you know, it's no surprise that you view faith as you do. They may come back very quickly and say, what do you mean by that? You know, again, gauge the tone. And then come back to what we started with in our scripture there uh, in Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. You know, just say, listen, you know, the Bible says that folks will look at the matter of faith, faith in Christ, Christianity, the good news of the gospel. You know, folks who don't know Jesus personally, you know, they'll, they'll view those things as being weak and foolish. Now, the Holy Spirit may be able to take that in that particular moment and there could very well be some sort of an aha moment in their own heart and mind as if to say, you know, I never really considered it quite like that. My goodness, the door continues to open a little bit wider. So again, you're not in this conversation by yourself. Your spirit of truth, your spirit of wisdom is the presence of Holy Spirit in you and with you. He'll give you discernment, wisdom as to where to go and how to uh, proceed further. Just be considerate of feelings here. You'll, you'll, you'll know the, the, the temperature in the room, so to speak, as things continue to progress. Okay? And, and listen, sitting down across the table 
and allowing the Holy Spirit to work through discussions that can be hard, okay? Uh, you know, not tense as if to say, you know, argumentative, but, uh, you know, wrestling with, with getting from where you started to where you feel like there's some resolution. That can be a bit of a struggle, so to speak. It can leave you feeling a bit taxed at the end of it all, but certainly well worth the time invested there, okay? So maybe we can go here. And we've already talked about introducing these as a real test of not just the climate of, of emotion, but where they truly are with the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, maybe it's time to go ahead and ask them about, you know, hey, tell me what you believe happens after you die, the afterlife. Uh, see what comes up. Uh, maybe, given some of the answers they provide there, maybe you could come back and ask them a very personal question. Listen, are you afraid of dying? And if they come back and say, well, you know, there's a part of that that I am fearful of, then ask them why. And then that may be the opportunity to really get to the bottom of some things. So, you know, hey, based on your view of what happens after we die or when we die from that point on, and maybe some fear that you have of that. Uh, in the here and now, do you think you're a good person? And you can take them from there to how the Bible says that there are none good. You can use the Ten Commandments as the premise there to prove that, that we all fall short, that we all have sinned. And for the person who's prideful and cynical and a bit pushy, in, in conversation. Th this is the Holy Spirit's way of, of humbling them. It may not sound humble on the surface, but the Holy Spirit can take the law, the Ten Commandments, and really level things out really, really clearly. But for those that are truly humbled and considerate of what's taking place and what has been said in the context of conversation, oh my goodness, now it's time to go for the good news of the gospel. Now, if they're willing to consider those things that God has intentionally placed within his word to confound the wise, so to speak, then even the book of Genesis, in which the story of Noah is included, can begin to open up. Because within the book of Genesis, we can see some of the biggest questions of our lives being addressed at the very beginning. The question of how we came to be purpose in life, the reality of evil, suffering, disease, the, the reason for death, the promise of life, and how that would be ultimately fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. So, you know, the Bible begins to open up when they're willing to consider the matter of faith and how that makes the Bible come alive. Again, a language that they can't speak, nor can they fully understand until they're willing to turn their heart and life over to Jesus Christ. You're there to plant seeds. You're there to sow gospel seeds. What an exciting opportunity this is. And when curiosity drives them into the Bible so that they can begin to look at it for what it could offer them and what it could mean for them, my goodness, uh, that, that's, there's no more exciting opportunity in a person's life before Christ enters into the picture than at that point in time when they're sincerely and genuinely seeking for his truth. And at some point in time, Holy Spirit will be right there to help lead them all the way to Christ and God can save them at that point. But it, it, as far as the matter of pride, uh, as, as prickly as some people can seem to be and as challenging emotionally as it might be for us to be in their company for very long. We've got to understand that if a person remains prideful all the way through their life and they never trust their heart and life to Christ before their life is over, uh, their future prospects after their life here ends is not good at all. And that could be the very understatement of this particular day. We're told in Proverbs 16 and 18 that pride comes before destruction and an arrogant spirit before a fall. That's out of the Christian Standard Bible. Destruction 
uh, eternal separation from God. Uh, need, need we say any more on that matter? But here's where we're going to end today. And uh, I just want you to uh, uh, consider this. This is out of Mark chapter 10, verses 13 through 16. I'm going to go ahead and read these to you. But it says, Then they brought little children to him, to Jesus, that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased, and he said to them, Let the little children come to me, and don't forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, again, this emphasis on verse 15, Assuredly, I say to you, whoever doesn't receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it, enter it at all. The Bible says, Then he took them up in his arms, he laid his hands on them, and then... He blessed them. So, entering the kingdom as a child, and I guess the comparison contrast that I would like to make today would be between these two words. And when we gather together the next time, we'll spend a few minutes talking about the distinct difference between being childish or childlike. How that Jesus loved having children around to bless, to be blessed, and to teach. We'll look next time about uh, the distinction between those two words and entering God's kingdom. Let me pray with you today. Father, we do thank you so much for bringing us together again. And we thank you most of all for providing Jesus. And Father, we, we, we thank you for providing him as the way to you. And as we continue this time, Father, I just pray that as we go out and about, our spiritual eyes and hearts will be open and soft and receptive to the opportunities around us. For those, Father, who don't know you personally and the free pardon of their sin, may we be that bright and shining light of truth. May we be willing, available, and accessible to share truth in love. Again, it's not about winning arguments or debates. It's about maintaining a genuine, sincere heart for lost people. Keep us, Father, uh, faithful. And at the end of each day, may we be found that way, faithful to you. That's our prayer, Father. We love you and we thank you so much. And we ask all this in the name above every name, Jesus Christ. We thank you once again for the cross. We thank you for the hope of that empty tomb. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. God bless your class. We'll see you next time.